Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Yeah, hi, good, good morning, Arundel Christian Church. And how about that time of worship together? I love being together in in this place together with other believers to worship God corporately. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Matt. For those who don't know me, uh, I serve as the lead pastor here. Uh, would love to get to know you. So if you're a guest here this morning, do me a favor. And after service outside, I'm going to be hanging out in the cafe lobby area. Would you do me a favor and come find me and shake my hand? Or we can fist bump, you know, cold and flu season, whatever you want. All right. Uh, I'd love to get to know you. Uh, we are in the middle of a series called Transformed, and this concept of transformation is really important to us at this church. In fact, our vision statement, right, if you haven't, if you haven't memorized it yet, now's the time to memorize it. You ready? It is to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. That's why we exist, right? That's what we're all about at this church. We want to see people. We have it right up there on the wall. We want to see people transformed. And that's why we're taking seven weeks at the beginning of the year. And we're talking about what does transformation look like? How can you walk through this, this process of transformation to look more like Jesus? And, and we've been talking through some different uh, uh, ways that we do that. And we've kind of been going back to this theme verse in 2 Corinthians. In chapter 3 it says, Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? We just sang about that, right? We just heard uh, that song, uh, that, that concept of freedom, that where there are chains, we know a chain breaker. We can be freed, right? And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is this freedom, and we all, who with unveiled faces, that's everyone in this room, who the veil has been re removed from your eyes, you now clearly see Jesus for who Jesus claims to be. That, that you're able to now contemplate the Lord's glory and that we're being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And I want you to know, uh, I love being the pastor of this church because I see transformation happening in this church. There's something powerful about being a part of a church that is, is committed to seeing people be transformed. You, you start the process at some point, you give your life to Jesus, and you hand it over and say, God, change me, right? This word transformed in this passage right above my head is the word metamorpha, the, where we get the word metamorphosis. God, take me. Uh, I'm going to start this process of, of faith, and now transform me. Turn me into the likeness of your son. Help me look more like Jesus. And that's what we're talking through. And we've, we've talked about the, the concept of transforming our faith. We've talked about the, the concept of transforming our thinking and our relationships and, and our body. We've talked about transforming this church. And today we're going to talk about something that none of you really want to talk about today. In fact, I want to I be honest with you. Whenever we know we're going to start talking about finances, we, we purposely don't like broadcast it very loudly because we know that if you are due a church skip day, this is the one that you'd skip, right? <laughs> but today we're going to talk about finances and here's why I want to talk about it. Uh, first of all, I recognize, let me just give you this caveat. I know that talking about finances, uh, that finances in general are a very personal thing, right? If you're in your life group, you probably don't have a hard time opening up about your faith you probably don't have a hard time talking about maybe some, some mental things and some emotional struggles you're having, having. You might open up about relational things, but it's very rare that we open up to each other about financial issues going on in our lives. We don't invite people over and say, hey, come on in. Here's my paycheck, right? I mean, that's, that's like personal. That's a private matter. The way, we, the way we spend our money is very personal, so we don't like to talk about it. We definitely don't like to hear other people tell us what to do with our money. So it, it's, in general, just kind of a topic that people like to avoid. And the church too often avoids it. But here's the truth. And we say this when he, whenever we talk about money at this church. God very much cares about how you use the finances and the resources that he's given to you. 
In fact, the conversation of, of money is, is really, if you look at all the things Jesus talked about when he was here on earth in the New Testament, all the things that Jesus talks about, the one topic that he talks about more than any other topic is money. And I think there's a really powerful reason why that is. In fact, all the parables that Jesus shares, whenever he shares a story, a parable is just another word for a story, you know that half of them are about how we use money. It's just amazing to me that this is a really important topic, but we don't talk about it very often. We don't like to talk about it. So I'll, I'll be uh, up front. I know that many don't want to talk about it, um, but the Bible talks about it, so we're going to talk about it. And I'm not going to apologize, all right? So here we go. We're going to read today, uh, we're going to read through the whole parable, the weirdest parable in the Bible, the weirdest story. This is one of those parables that when you're going through your 90-day reading, uh, you've already read past this one by now, and I'm sure that as you read it, you were probably thinking, what in the world is Jesus t telling this story for? It doesn't make any sense. It's got to be one of the weirdest stories Jesus ever told. In fact, it's one of those that you kind of like rack your brain thinking, what is Jesus trying to tell us in this so let's read it together, and then we'll, we'll kind of examine it together. So Luke chapter 16, uh, verses 1 through 14. So I'm reading quite a bit. Hopefully you have your Bibles open. You can read along. I have it on the screen above my head, too. And here's what it says. It says, Jesus told this story to his disciples. It says, there was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day... Uh, one day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, What is this I hear about you? Get your report in order, because you are going to be fired. And essentially, what he does, he says, Listen, I've heard that you're not, they're not using the resources that I've given you very well, so I need you to come in here and show me how you're using my money, because if it's not what it's supposed to be, you're out on the street. You're getting fired today. Okay? And then it goes on. It says, the manager thought to himself. And here's the only reason the manager would think what he's about to think. Is he knows that as he goes and presents a report, that the report is going to show not the right thing. The report is going to show that he ought to be fired. Not the other way around. So the manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have strength to dig ditches. And I'm too proud to beg. Uh, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. Here's basically the modern day version of this. The guy just got canned, but the employer hasn't yet removed his database access. Right? He can still log into his email, and he can still operate on behalf of his employer. None of those things have been turned off yet. So he's sitting there thinking, today's the day I go home. Today's the day I lose access to be able to do anything about this. So this is what the guy comes up with. So he calls these people in who owe his boss money, and he, he says to them, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager logs into the database, and he says, hey, Let's make it 400. And then he, he looks to the next guy and says, how much do you owe? And he says, I owe 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal. I love that. He had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. Don't forget that word. In fact, circle that word. We're going to talk about that word today, shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are trustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? No one can serve two masters. For they will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and be enslaved to money. 
the Pharisees who heard this dearly, who, or sorry, who, who dearly loved their money, heard this and scoffed at him. A scoffed is, in your version of the Bible, you might have the word laughed. The Pharisees were, were people who were known for having extravagant things. They had figured out how to accumulate a lot of money. They were in love with money. So when Jesus is sharing this story with the Pharisees, who were really his audience in this parable, uh, they laughed. They thought, oh, that's what poor people would say, right? I mean, they're basically laughing at Jesus in his story about money. So I have a question for you. Is it that Jesus right here in this parable, doesn't it seem like at first glance that Jesus is basically saying, hey, it's, look at this guy. He, he was really dishonest with his, with his responsibilities, and then he was even further dishonest and forgave a bunch of debt that he wasn't really supposed to. Hey, be like that. Doesn't it sound like that's kind of like what Jesus is saying, that he's, he's actually uh, praising a dishonest act? It seems like that a little bit, doesn't it? But the truth is, that's not what Jesus is doing here. He's not saying, look at the dishonesty of this man and be like that. What he's saying is, look at the shrewdness of this man. And what if we could learn to be like that with our own money? What if we could learn to be shrewd? I want to um, tell you that this idea of the word shrewd, whenever I hear it, I think it's it doesn't sound like a very good word, doesn't it? It rhymes with the word rude. That's what I hear. When I hear the word shrewd, I think it's like basically being rude with your money. But the truth is that shrewd isn't a bad thing. Shrewdness uh, is a very good thing. In fact, the word means to be wise and to use the resources you have to accomplish the purpose that you have for them. If you can take what you've been given and use them in such a way to accomplish a good goal, you are being shrewd. And it is good for all of us in this room to learn how to be shrewd. What the Bible says, what Jesus is teaching us, is we need to learn how to use the resources we've been given to accomplish the purpose that we've been given and to do it wisely, to do it well. Now, you might think, how dare, let me, let me challenge you for a moment. You might hear this story about the Pharisees laughing at Jesus. You might think, wow, Jesus just told them a story and they laughed at his face. How dare they do that? But the truth is, in this room, uh, and let me just ask you a real honest question. Do you laugh at the things Jesus tells you to do with your money? <laughs> Do you do, with the resources God has given to you, what he's asked you to do, or do you laugh it off as well? And I think that's important for us to talk about that and to learn some things, because the, the, the real kind of big point here is that you are going to either manage your money, or your money is going to master you. In this room, you have two options. You can either learn to be in control over the, the resources that you've been uh, kind of put in stewardship over. You can learn how to control those things and use them shrewdly to accomplish a good purpose. Or you can be enslaved to money. You can let money master you and chase after it your whole life trying to figure out what its purpose is. What if all of us in this room could say, I want to be transformed in my finances. I want to figure out what I have and what I've been in, what's been entrusted to me, and I want to figure out how to, to change the way I see money and the resources that God has given to me. And let's look at this parable and see if we can find a few things that we can walk away with. So five, five financial lessons from this parable. And we're going to go through the first few pretty quickly, so keep up uh, on your notes, all right? So number one, the first of the lessons is this, everything you have belongs to God. Everything you have belongs to God. Now, you might not like this. You might not even believe this, all right? You might be outside of faith right now, and you're just exploring what the Bible teaches, and, and I'm glad you're here, but at the end of the day, I want you to know the Bible is really clear that the car you came here in, the meal you ate this morning, the plate that that meal came on, the bed you woke up in, the house you woke up in, all of those things, according to Scripture, belong to God. I know it's really hard for us because we're thinking, man, I worked really hard for that. I saved up and I, put, I worked hard and I got money and I put it in the bank and then I took that money and I bought this thing. Uh, it's, it's nice for us to think that the things that we've worked really hard for are ours. But the truth is even that job that you have where you were able to earn that money or that place that that money, whatever it is, all of that was a blessing from God. Everything you have is his. 
And here's the great thing about that truth, all right? Listen to this. If you recognize that, that, that car that you saved up a lot of money for to finally buy, that it's God's, if you can realize that, it, pay, it works both ways. Check this out, right? When you're driving down the road and that car breaks down, right, you get out of the car and you're thinking, I don't know, uh, right now I don't have the money to fix it, I don't know what to do. Listen, you can be like, hey, God, this is yours. <laughs> right? God, your car broke down. We gotta, we gotta remind ourselves that everything we have has been played, that we've been entrusted these things from God. And if you look in this parable, right, it says that there is a rich man who had a manager managing his money. The rich man is, is God. God owns everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the stinking hills. All right, he owns everything. And that, that rich man, that rich employer, has placed us as managers over his resources. So you've been given things, but they're not yours to keep. Not yet. They're, they're yours to use to, to accomplish the purposes of your employer. That's what you have those resources for. All right, here's the second lesson. Number two is we need to learn not to rely on money for security. Don't rely on money for security. Now, we're, we're a church where, you know, some of us in this room are, are kind of, the, we, we give some feedback, right? We say amen every once in a while. And I love that, by the way. It's really uh, encouraging when you're teaching to hear some positive feedback. But I, I was reading this this week, and I read this Bible verse, and I said, man, I bet you this is an amen verse right here. I don't know. We'll see. Here's what Proverbs 23, 5 says. It says, in the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. I mean, I, I think that's one that all of us know to be very true. That in the blink of an eye, whatever you've put, you know, if you put all of your energy into putting all of your security in your money, that one day you will learn that, that money comes and goes, right? Money is not a good place to, to rely for security. Life happens, things break, jobs change, job statuses change, all sorts of things can happen in our life. And if we have all of our security tied up in the money, then we have things wrong. What we should do is have all of our security tied up in the, the employer. Right? We got to recognize that the, the, the rich, that God who owns everything, we place our trust in him and he'll take care of the rest. Instead of putting our trust in the things that he's entrusted to us. So you can't rely on money for security. Here's a third lesson that we see. Number three. It says that God uses our finances to test us. God uses our finances to test us. How many of you, just out of curiosity, when you were in school, some of you still are in school, were, were excellent test takers. You just went in. It didn't matter what the test was on. You could always figure out what the teacher was trying to figure out, and you would use like this, this ninja logic, and you would figure out it's got to be B. And you, would just, you didn't have to study. You just did good on every test you took. How many of you were good test takers? I see a few hands. I'm putting my hand up. I, I never studied, and I just kind of went in that day, and I opened up my book real fast, and I was like, all right, we're ready. Um, super unfair, right? How many of you struggled to take tests, right? You would go in there, and there was an obvious right answer, and somehow you'd psych yourself out, and you would think it's a trick question, and you'd pick something else. I'm like, why did you do that, right? Some of us are really bad at tests, but the truth is that one of the things that we learn in this parable is that God has given us our financial resources specifically as a test. This is essentially when, you are, when your paycheck comes in, just recognize every time that comes in, it's a test. There's three questions on this test. All right, let me show you the three questions. The first one is this. What, you, uh, what do you love the most? What do you love the most? This is the first question that is on this, this test. Let me share with you a, a quote from uh, Pastor Rick Warren that I thought was just so powerful. It says this, God doesn't need your money. He wants what it represents, your heart. 
You see how this is a test? He, he gives you the money. He says, listen, I don't need it, but I, I'm going to give it to you as a test to see what is it that you really love. Do you love me and the purposes I've given to you, or do you love you and the purposes you've given to you? Because you're going to now answer that, that test question with this money I've given to you. How are you going to use it? You see, ultimately, back to that, that question, what do you love the most? Uh, one of the things that's interesting in my house, when, I, uh, when my kids were young, and maybe your kids did this also if you have young children, but have you ever asked them a question that, that goes like this, what is your favorite blank? You know, what is your favorite color? When I would ask my kids, what is your favorite color? You know, wh- wh- one of them told me, um, blue, green, yellow, orange, purple, right? And they just go and list all the colors. I don't think you understand what the word favorite means, right? When you do that, when you have a favorite, you're actually asking someone, you know, what is that, the top, what sits in that top spot? What's your number one? If all the other colors were to die right now, which is the one color that you couldn't live without? Like, what is your favorite? And ultimately, money has the ability to figure out what do you love the most? What is the favorite thing in your life? We, we talk about this all the time here. When, if, if you want to find out what someone really loves, you really need to get a sneak peek into two things, right? You need to peek into their calendar book, you know, their planner. Maybe it's online, like Outlook or whatever, or your, their Google calendar, or maybe it's a, like, if you're like my wife, you have like a, 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 every year you have your planner. And just get a peek into it, and you'll find out what they love by how they spend their time, right? You'll also get a sneak peek into their online bank statement. I was going to say checkbook, but half of you don't know what I'm talking about when I say that. <laughs> get, get a peek into their, their, their online bank statement and see how they spend their money. Because if we can see how you spend your time and how you spend your money, without a doubt, it's going to show the full picture of what you're in love with. It's going to show, it. Do, do you really care about your church? Your, your bank account's going to show that. Your, your calendar is going to show that. Do you really care about uh, this hobby? You know, are you really in love with a, a certain, like golf, right? You're going to be able to look at your bank account and your planner and figure out whether or not that's something that, is in, you know, that you're passionate about. Those two things can tell a lot about where your, your love is. And God uses money in this way. The problem is, you know, that, that we, we have this, this ability that we think somehow we can serve both God and money. That both of them can be in that top spot in our lives. But the truth is, in verse 13, it says that you can't serve both God and money. You can't have God as your favorite and money as uh, your, your other favorite. you got to pick one. Let me share with you a few other verses that help kind of hit this home. Matthew 6 says this, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. What this verse is saying is that wherever you spend your treasure, that's what you're in love with. This is a test, you see. How you spend your money determines what your greatest love is. Ecclesiastes 5 says this. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. I like how this verse really kind of gives us a real practical test. Some of you in this room, you're like, like, I don't think I love money. I think I'm good. I think I got a handle on that question. I think I'm, let me ask you, right? Are you constantly thinking about, man, I just need more? I wish I had more money. I can't wait till my next pay raise. I wish you know, I, I'll hit the lottery. You know, whatever. Like, I, I just need more money. If that's constantly on your mind, the Bible's really clear that you have a love affair with money. All right, here's a second question on this test. Remember, God uses finances to test us. Here's your second test question. In what and in whom do you trust? In what... And in whom do you trust? Where have you placed your trust, essentially, is this this test question that comes in when God gives you his resources to manage. Here's the crazy thing, right? If you open up your wallet right now and you pull out a $1 bill, a $5 bill, $10 bill, $20 bill, 
$50 bill, $100 bill, it doesn't matter what denomination, you pick it out, right, there's going to be four words on your money that are trying to remind you of something really important. What are those four words? Say it out loud. In God we trust. In God we trust. Listen, even your money is trying to remind you, don't trust me. Your money is saying, listen, I know it's easy to pull it out of your wallet or pull it out of the bank and say, I'm putting my trust in this right here. I know that this can accomplish whatever I need it to accomplish, and I'm kind of tied up in this thing, and your money is shouting at you, don't do it. Don't put your trust in me. Don't put your trust in what I can buy for you. Don't put your trust in earthly possessions. Trust in God alone. That's what your money is shouting at you every time you use it. In God, we ought to trust. In God we trust. And the problem is, though, that money becomes a God for many people. Many of you, you hear, in God we trust, and you're thinking, man, I've made a God out of this bill. I'm trusting in the God I've made it to be, and I'm putting all my reliance on it. But here, Proverbs 11, verse 28, it says this. Trust in your money, and, you, and down you will go. Yeah, it couldn't be any clearer, right? Hey, church, listen, if you trust in your money... Down you will go, but the godly flourish like leaves in spring. I was seeing that, that, that wording, down you will go. What, what it really means is if you trust in your money, you're going to fall, right? You're going to fall. And what, here's some things I think that are helpful to remember that you are going to fall for. When you trust in your money, uh, some things I've seen people fall for. You're going to fall uh, into materialism. You're going to believe that you can find your identity in the things that you can buy and the happiness that they bring you. You're going to fall for that trap. You're going to fall into, the, into greed, right? You're going to store up money for no purpose other than to store up money. You're going to fall into the trap of just having more and more and hoarding it all for yourself. You're going to fall into that. Some of you are going to fall into a get-rich-quick scheme. Seriously, when you're in love with money and someone comes along and says, hey, do this and you'll be rich tomorrow, it's easy for us to have so much love uh, of money that we fall for that and we find ourselves duped. Some of us, we fall into workaholism. Let me, let me be really clear. It is absolutely a good thing to be a hard worker. It is another thing to be addicted to work. And some of us, were so addicted to our jobs because of the money that they bring in and we just can't get enough of it so we work and we work and we work because we put all of our trust in money don't do that here's a third question on that test three questions on this test the third is this are you trustworthy here's what this question really means god is saying can i entrust my resources to you and trust you to do with them what I wanted you to do with them. When I give you things, are you going to take them and use them the way I intended you to use them, or are you going to use them the way you wanted to use them? It's essentially a test that says, are you trustworthy? Can I trust you to fulfill my mission with what I've given to you? Luke 16, so in this, par in this parable, in the 10th verse, it says this, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Let me, I'm going to just get really blunt here with this verse for a moment. And uh, if you are in this room right now, and you've been kind of on the fence about whether or not ACC is the church for you, and you're just kind of waiting for Pastor Matt to say that one more thing that's just going to be like, I'm done. I got good news for you. I'm about to say it, all right? I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me and said, Matt, I wish I could be generous and give to the church. In fact, I want to do that, but if, if God would just give me more money, then I'll be generous with it. And let me tell you really bluntly, all right, what the Bible says about that. No, you won't. So the Bible says. It says that if you are dishonest with little you will be dishonest with much. And if you are honest with little, you will be honest with much. If you can learn when you don't have a lot how to be honest with it and to use your resources to be trustworthy with your resources and use them for God's purposes, then when he gives you more, he knows he can trust you to be honest with more. 
But when you're dishonest with a little bit, you will be dishonest with a lot. I'm just telling you. It's, it's an honesty, it's an integrity issue. It has nothing to do with how much money you have. I, I will, from a personal experience, I will tell you, my wife and I, when we decided to start tithing, we did not have nearly enough money to start tithing to pay all of our bills. And we just said, you know what? We need to be trustworthy with what God has given to us and trust him, the, the owner of everything, to take care of the details. So here, here's my point. Listen, if you have little, be trustworthy with little. And if you have a lot, be trustworthy with a lot. All right, here's a fourth The fourth thing we learn about our finances from this parable is this. Make a plan and stick to it. Make a plan and then take that plan and stick to it. Do what what your plan says to do, right? In Proverbs 14.8, it says the prudent, in other words, the wise or the shrewd, understand where they are going, but fools deceive themselves. In other words, you have to really kind of three parts to this. You have to understand where it is that you're trying to get to. You have to come up with a plan for how you're going to get there. And then get this. You actually have to stick to your plan. you got to implement your plan or you're not going to go anywhere. And we see this in this parable of the shrewd manager. One of the things that as Jesus is praising this guy in his dishonest act, he's not really praising the act. He's praising the fact that he came up with a plan and he implemented it and it worked. He was shrewd. And we also need to figure out how to come up with a plan and how to know where we're going and then to stick to it. And that's why if you're in this room right now and you haven't yet attended Financial Peace University, this is the perfect time to be here because next Sunday it meets during Sunday mornings. So if you're like, I'm not available on Sunday mornings, nice try, right? You're here, all right? Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. So during this service... We have Financial Peace University starting next week. So what you can do is is come to the first service or the third service instead and attend Financial Peace University during the second service. And we we want to invite you to be a part of that because at FPU, you're going to learn how to set goals to know where you're going. You're also going to be given a plan for what you're supposed to do, and then you'll be given the tools to stick to it. You'll be given everything you need to implement those. Now, a lot of people, by the way, FPU, uh, a lot of people think Financial Peace University is just for people whose finances are in a wreck. It's not true, all right? If your finances are a wreck, you should be in Financial Peace University. If your finances are in order and you've never attended Financial Peace University, you should be in Financial Peace University. It's kind of a a course that everybody ought to take once, all right? So if you haven't done that yet, uh, I want to encourage you to sign up to take that growth course starting next week. You know, one of the funniest things, though, I've learned about people coming up with plans is many of us have plans when it comes to our finances, but they're really lousy plans. Can we be honest with that? We come up with a plan, but our plan is this. All right, my plan is I'm going to cross my fingers and hope this all works out. Like, that's not a plan. If your plan is I'm going to go to 7-Eleven after this and buy a, a scratcher, if that's your plan, that's a lousy plan. If your plan, right, is I, I just, I'm going to hope all of my sons are really great at basketball and get scholarships, right? Or that's it's a bad plan, right? So don't have a bad plan, have a good plan, right? And then stick to it. Proverbs 16.9 says, we should make plans, counting on God to direct us. Don't come up with a bad plan, come up with a good one. You know, the wildest thing, though, for me, uh, and maybe other people struggle like I do, I'm really good at knowing where I want to go, And I'm really good at coming up with a plan. I'm really bad sometimes at starting. How many of you, like, listen, you you already know what room you're going to remodel in your house next. You already know what color you're going to do. You've already picked out where where things are going to go. But you just are having a hard time kind of getting going, right? You know what I'm talking about. Some of us are really bad starters. I was watching HGTV this week, and there was the Property Brothers, and they were redoing this office space for a, a couple. And in, in the office, they put up this quote, and I loved it so much, I wanted to share it with you. It's this, starting requires a start. If you're going to start something, guess what? You can't just be like, yeah, I'm going to start that. 
You have to actually start it, right? Starting requires you deciding. But by the way, many people in this room have probably heard something from this stage before. You've opened up the Bible and God was speaking to you and challenging you in something. And you thought, yes, I'm going to make a change. And you're still waiting to do it. You haven't started yet. Starting requires a start. What is God calling you to do with your finances that you need to start today? Here's the fifth lesson we learned from this parable. Is that money is a tool to be used for God's purposes. Money is a tool to be used for God's purposes. Here's what I mean by this. Money is not good. Money is not bad. Money is neutral. Money in and of itself isn't the thing that's the problem, right? Uh, You can use money for good things. You can use money for bad things. Money in and of itself is is neutral. It is a tool that God gives you to use for his purposes. Remember in verse 9 of our parable, it said this. Jesus says, here's a lesson. Here's what I'm trying to teach you with this parable. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. Then when all your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Even this lesson seems a little odd to me. Like, what is Jesus actually saying here? And let let me try to give you an idea of what I think is is the point of this this verse. Jesus is saying, listen, I've, I've given you money as a tool, and I want you to take this tool to fulfill this purpose, which is to benefit others who have a need, to be generous with what you've been given, and the second part is where I get confused, and to make friends. I think we all know, by the way, that you can make a lot of friends when you have a lot of money, don't you? Yeah, you, you win the lottery, you'll, you'll be, have a lot of friends real quick, right? Like, money has the ability to, to, to create new relationships and to, to create friends, but I don't think that this is actually about using your worldly resources to create to create just people around you here on earth to come and like tell you how awesome you are and to, to come and you know play bunko at your house. Right? I don't think that's what this verse is about. I think this kind of verse is what, what it's saying is that when you use your resources to help other people here on earth and to build the kingdom so that one day when you are standing in the presence of God, there will be people all over the place that, you have the, that you've been a part of their faith journey. You're a part of the reason why they're standing in heaven. It was what you did and your generosity that you created people around you that you'll be able to enjoy eternity with. You'll have eternal friends because of your generosity. I don't know if you've uh, heard the song. It's pretty old, but it's by Ray Bolts called Thank You for Giving to the Lord. Let me, I just want to read the lyrics to you, and then we're going to be done. Let me, let me read these to you. So, by the way, this is a song about uh, a man who, who dies and is now in heaven. And Ray is writing the lyrics about what he's, he's seeing in this. He says, You turned and saw a young man He was smiling as he came. He said, friend, you may not know me now. But then he said, but wait. You used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. Every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. One morning you said that prayer and I asked Jesus in my heart. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad you gave. And then another man stood before you and said, Remember the time a missionary came to your church and his pictures made you cry? You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. Jesus took the gift you gave, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad that you gave. And then one by one they came as far as the eyes could see. Each one somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done and sacrifices you had made. Unnoticed on the earth, heaven now proclaims. And I know up in heaven that you're not supposed to cry. But I was almost sure there were tears in your eyes. As Jesus took your hand and you stood before the Lord 
And he said, child, look around you, for great is your reward. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Here's the truth. One day, according to this parable, God calls you to use your resources to help the people around you and to build up a multitude of people who one day will come up to you in heaven and say thank you for using your resources towards the purpose that God had given you. I'm a life that was changed. Now we get to be friends for eternity together. See, one day, Romans 14 says this, each of us will give a personal account to God. One day, each of us will be standing before God, and just like this this manager was standing before his employer, and the manager said, I want you to give me a report. I want you to show me, have you been using the resources I gave you the way I wanted you to use them? And we're going to stand before God as believers and give a report for how we use the things that we were given. I wrote this little rhyme. Uh, maybe it'll be helpful to you. I thought it was, it was helpful to me, so I wrote it. Um, it says this, In this life, what I have I do not own. It's all just on loan. In the next life, what I have sown I will reap, and what I have been given I will keep. I just want you to remember this, this simple thing that what you have here isn't yours, it's God's. It's been given to you as a test to see how you'll use these resources of his. And if you'll be trustworthy and whether or not you'll, your, your greatest love is what it's supposed to be. And will you use these resources to fulfill God's purpose or yours? And at one point you're going to face God and you're going to give an account for how you used what he gave you. And the rewards that are given to you then will be yours to keep. Let's make sure not to miss out on the opportunity to to celebrate on that day. So as we always do, we close with this three-word prayer. And I want to ask you to say this prayer in your heart right now. God, what now? What now, God? I want to ask you to consider two things. Number one, I want you to have a good plan with your finances and stick to it. Come up with a good plan and stick to it. And part of that might be attending Financial Peace University next week. If you need to do that, then you need to do that, all right? Here's the second thing I want to ask you to consider, is to honor God with his finances. Remember, they're all his. Honor God with his finances through giving towards his purposes. Let's pray together. God, we recognize that you are good and that you've given to us abundantly. Every single one of us in this room, even if we look at what we have and we think it's not enough, we're having a hard time paying some bills, we're we're not quite sure how to pay our rent this this week. God, we recognize that everything we have has been a gift from you and that compared to the rest of this world, we are incredibly wealthy. You've been so incredibly generous to us. And as you're entrusting us with a little, allow us to be trustworthy with a little. And as as you give us a lot, allow us to be a church that is trustworthy with a lot. Allow us to give the way you've intended us to give and to to answer these three test questions the way you long for us to answer. We love you. God, we want to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. In your name, we pray. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.